What happens when you combine AI with human intelligence? One answer is that you get Unbabel, a machine translation service on a mission to solve one of humanity's most vexing challenges, language barriers. At Unbabel, the ultimate goal is to be able to communicate with anyone, anywhere in the world, regardless of their native language. But to achieve that lofty goal, we need data, we need translators, and we need them to work together. Yao Grasa is the co-founder and CTO of Unbabel, and on this episode of IT Visionaries, he discusses how his company is working to bring those two sides together to get closer to a future when we can rely on machine translation. Enjoy this episode. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. This podcast is created by the team at mission.org. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, host of IT Visionaries. And today we have special guest, Joel, what's going on? Hi, Ian. Uh, Everything's going very well. Well, we're excited to have you on today and uh, and to talk about everything you are doing. So first, let's get into it. How did you get started in technology? Uh, I guess like uh, most kids through video games. So I had the ZC, ZX Spectrum back in the day and I loved playing. And I had to learn to do some basic coding to add some sheets to the game. And from that on, I just keep going. I really love the ability to like create stuff via code. I then went to a computer science course and did a PhD in machine learning, and I haven't stopped since then. I love it. And flash forward to today, um, tell me a little bit about what it means to be CTO and co-founder of Unbabel. I mean, so Unbabel is a company that removes language barriers by combining AI and a real-time crowd of human translations. So we basically build an enterprise solution that allows brands to talk with their customers in their native language. Uh, in an effective way. And we've been working with, uh, comp- with big brands like Microsoft, Facebook, Booking. Uh, and it's been really challenging because given my background, uh, I've had the chance to apply what I learned on my PhD uh, on a real use case. And basically, as a CTO, I'm responsible for the technology solutions that allow and make our product possible. Uh, and I have a diverse team between AI researchers, engineers, and actually linguists as well that make sure that we're doing the right stuff. Uh, so it's been a very interesting adventure. And so are you responsible for, like, are you in the trenches writing code? Are you, uh, are you working on that piece of it? Do you manage the technology, uh, the internal technology stack for the employees? Like, what's the scope of your responsibilities? Yeah, so I'm not writing code anymore. That was like early days. Uh, I managed basically at the strategy level, uh, working with like engineering, AI, in linguistics together with product to develop our solutions. So basically making sure that every, all the pieces fit together well. Yeah, I, it's so, so interesting. You have this, you know, obviously a PhD in, in natural language processing and, and you have so much research knowledge. Um, I was just curious, like, how much do you still get into the weeds uh, in terms of, you know, building the platform and all of that? Well, I used to say that I, I now code on Google Drive or on Chart.io. So looking at data, uh, I keep uh, very much updated what's being done in academia and research and talking with the AI teams to kind of figure out what's the next step that we should be taking uh, and basically bring that knowledge to the knowledge about the problems that we're trying to solve and try to basically propose solutions, identify problems. Um, but yes, I do miss some of the being on the trenches part. And, and we'll get into automated translation in, in a little bit here, but I do want to um, focus on the company for a second. So you all have been backed by a lot of really, uh, you know, big names in in venture capital. Uh, you have a bunch of really cool uh, customer use cases and stuff right now. Just from a company perspective, where where are you all at? I mean, so we've been growing a lot on this uh, customer service uh, vertical. Um, and working with big customers. And, and I guess that has been like the learning curve is where does our technology find a good spot? And this has been the, the first spot. Uh, and we're now basically moving from that to build our vision, which is a translation layer. So focusing on customer support and then what are the other use cases that we should go after afterwards? 
So let's get into automated translation. Um, this is something that clearly uh, is absolutely critical for every business who wants to go global or who is global right now. But it's something that just hasn't been done very well. Can you kind of just share like the scope of the industry? Yeah, I mean, so machine translation is a very hard problem. Um, and so we've seen a lot of progress on machine translation over the last uh, decade. But it's still not there. So basically, what you have is a spectrum from the fully machine translation solutions, uh, where you can think about Google Translate as like the, the most famous one, where you know it's faster, quality is better, but it's still not reliable. You don't trust Google Translate to translate something and send to your customer. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the more traditional translation industry, where you have professional translators working more on the project base to the translations. Uh, we fit in the middle, so we, use, we highly use machine translation, and then we have other technology that we develop called quality estimation that tries to tell us, is this good translation to send or does it need improvements? In which case, we rely on our community of translators to correct the errors and submit to the customer in a very fast way, like eight to 10 minutes, and then we get more data to train the, the model. Um, and the way I see it is like, this is the solution that allows you to basically leverage the most the automatic translation part because it gives you the reliability that you otherwise don't have. Yeah, it you know, with some of the, the companies that we work with, you know, you, you go to their website and they have, you know, web pages for all of their different markets and they have, you know, things in different languages. That's just from a website perspective, mm -hmm. which is really, you know, not that complex of a problem. When you're talking about something, you know, like an app or or product SKUs or things that are so different, that are so complex. Um, what do some of these like extremely complex companies do? Like what did they do before Unbabel? What were they, were they just doing, like you said, kind of a combination of, of Google Translate plus uh, working with like contractors or consultants? No, so traditionally like the web pages, the marketing material is addressed by these uh, language providers, which at the end are basically professional translators work on a translation. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming. Uh, it actually poses a problem on scalability. Um, people would use machine translation more for user reviews and basically to get an understanding of what your customers were doing, but not to produce outbound material to, to submit. So this is why it's, it's been hard for companies to scale and support all the languages. So in fact, if you go to some of the biggest companies and you try to reach them out in your native language and you're like Portuguese, you probably won't get a lot of success. Yeah, that's crazy. That's a pretty remarkable kind of state of affairs that like we have, you know, I, I, well, at least from, from my perspective, it seems like we like, quote unquote, have the technology to translate. But you think about how complex language is. And, you know, we've had a few folks on here that understand NLP, and we've talked about it a little bit on the show. Um, but all of the colloquialisms, all of the sayings, all of the other things, you always see that list at the end of the year of like, marketing campaigns uh, <laughs> fails, where it's like, yeah. you know, the person changes their slogan to, uh, to something in another language, and then it, it doesn't, <laughs> it means something totally different and things like that. I mean, obviously, it's incredibly complex. But, um, but like, like, why is it so behind? What is the importance of, of the machine learning piece of this? I mean, I think it's, it's a very hard problem. In fact, uh, some people argue that if you solve translation, you kind of solve the AI issue. Um, because of all this ambiguity that the language has and this huge space of words and meanings, um, so it makes it very hard. So there, there has been a lot of advances, uh, namely like with uh, statistical machine translation, we become much better and you could learn from this massive parallel corpus. Then you went to deep learning and you get not only better learning algorithms, but you also got these word representations that were much stronger and in context, which removes some of the ambiguity that you had on translation, like the word bank. Is it like the bank of the money? Is it like the bank where you sit? Um, but for instance, we're still not good at dealing with these colloquial expressions or multiple expressions. We still don't know how to parse them in a proper way and find a way to translate them accordingly. We're still not good at dealing with very large sentences. Um, so there are still some challenges and again, language is always evolving. So even when you think you nail it, something else comes out that, uh, kind of screws you. And then you have the customization part. So 
when you go to enterprise customers, they have their own brand, their own tone of voice, their, their own way that they want to communicate with the customers. And so it's very hard to teach a machine to do this um, in a generic way. Yeah, so, so what are the types of sources that you're using to train your AI? Like, are you using things like open source? Or are you using like, I don't know, you crawling Merriam-Webster? Like, I don't know, what are the different things that you're putting into this? That's a very interesting um, question. So, I mean, there is a lot of uh, freely available parallel data to train what we call a generic engine. So, an engine that is more or less good for everything, like Google Translate. Uh, and those you can just get or you can crawl, but you, it's easy to get your hands on that. Uh, now, what the good thing about Embevel is because we have this human-in-the-loop approach, we're at the same time a very good data generation machine. So, once we award a customer, we immediately start translating their data with humans correcting the errors and generating data for that customer. So pretty soon, we can have a model that is customized for that particular customer that has learned his terminology, uh, his language guidelines, and becomes a super uh, strong engine for that particular brand. Yeah, that makes sense. What are some of the, the things then that, that you see as challenges for your team and in trying to expand the data set? Um, is it just kind of like, you know, time will tell sort of a thing. Like as, as you get more, it will just get better and better. It, the, the thing that I've always thought about translation, and maybe this is naive, is just like, oh, one day we'll just get there. Um, but one day we'll get there means that like people like you start companies that create something that is much better than Google Translate. You know what I mean? So I, I'm just curious, like what are some of the challenges that, that you all face? I mean, so there's some fundamental challenges that we don't understand. So the first basic one, and this applies to natural language processing in general, is that we're still very naive on how we do stuff. So we don't understand language. We find patterns in language and we know how to translate the patterns. So for instance, like one of the visions of machine translation since the early days in the 50s was that you build this interlingual representation and then generate from there. And to build this, you understand the syntax, the semantics. This was never reached. We just translate words by words. On the other hand, we still have difficulties to deal with like uh, rare events, so words that you haven't seen very frequently, how we generate them. It's, it's hard to learn from that. Um, it's hard to learn from uh, multi-word expressions. So there's still a lot of chances. On the other hand, if you look at the current systems, they're mostly operating on the sentence by sentence level. So for instance, if you have a sentence with a pronoun and you have translated to Portuguese that has gender, you don't know if it's masculine or feminine. So even if you have a lot of data, there are still some limitations on the models that you're using that will not allow you to get the quality that you desire. So there has to be an improvement on the models, on the understanding. So there's still quite a road to, to go to have this kind of like universal translator that works on every single situation. One of the, uh, one that we had a guest on, um, actually this is a different show, um, where they were talking about how they did a marketing campaign and I forget which country they were running it in, but it was all about like uh, hitting a home run. Mm -hmm. And uh, like everything was about like this whole campaign was kind of like, you know, it's like, hey, hit a home run with your HR or something like that. Uh, and none of the none of the countries that that they were marketing to like play baseball or like more or less don't play baseball. And so pretty much nobody understood that it was a home run. In the business world, it seems like there are so many like either sport driven uh, colloquialisms or things like that. It seems like a lot of those type of things like wouldn't necessarily have a translation, right? Like what would what would a home run like what does that mean in another language? Uh, like, do you translate it to another sport outcome? Do you just like, you know, do things like that? Like, how do you look at like those type of phrases? I mean, right now, you don't stand a chance because those, are, those depend a lot on the context and on the, um, I mean, actually on the cultural context. So that is not going to be a good translation. You can actually translate to a, a little translation of home run in Portuguese, but people will not understand it. So there's, there's not a solution for that right now. So that's why humans are so important because they know what that means and what they can use instead of that. The systems have no idea. So I think we're still very far away from getting to a point where you understand what is the intent that you want to convey with a home run and find the equivalent uh, in Portuguese. I remember something that is very interesting. Like I, I think it was my first class 
on natural language processing when we reached the machine translation. The first um, description on the on the book was about the issue of how do you explain or how do you translate that God is my shepherd if you're in a country that doesn't have any sheep, like. And, and, oh, yeah. and it's kind of like the same the same issues like you need to you need to have someone that understands what does a shepherd mean and what would be an equivalent to a different culture so that is a very strong problem not i think that one is still very far away from uh, from solving when i was in brazil i learned pondicaju mm-hmm. and that was the main thing that i knew how to say because <laughs> as much cheesy bread as i could eat is pretty much what i went for um but you have, you know, you have things like, um, you know, I remember I took like a bunch of Duolingo before I went over there, things like that. You know, you have things where people are trying to learn languages to try to, you know, bridge some of their personal gaps as they're traveling, things like that. I, you know, I think that kind of like what we all thought the future would be at some point is, you know, you have a device that you just say words into and then it spits it back out to the person that you're talking to um, so that you could really talk to anyone in the world. Um, How far do you think like that reality is? I mean, uh, it depends. So let's for sake of argument assume that I'm going to Japan and I don't speak English. I'll be probably much better off speaking to Google Translate and show it to a Japanese person that's just making gestures. So it, it does bring some uh, usefulness. Um, now, if you're talking about I would go to Japan and I'll have a serious conversation with someone about the meaning of life and what I want to do in the future of my life in my midlife crisis, uh, I think we're very far to having a translation system that could go to that deep level of conversation and do an accurate translation. So some languages don't have like a tremendous amount of data Mm -hmm. behind them, right? It's not, you know, obviously like English is everywhere and French is everywhere and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. What about like the ones that, that don't have a lot of information behind them? If like either smaller dialects or things like that, like how do you work on, on those? Or is that not a priority right now? And you're trying to work on others. Like, I'm just curious. I mean, so that is actually another of the challenges of any data-driven approach or machine learning approach, and machine translation is one of them, is if you don't have data, you can't learn. Uh, And and I see that problem, so I can split that problem in two sides. So one is you're trying to translate into a language that has very little resources, and that is super hard. We're not, we don't have that problem that much because normally that means that you also have a lot of customers that want to translate to that language. But on research, on academia, that is a, a, a big open problem and normally, like, there are two main classes of approaches. So one is you use a similar language as a, to do a bridge. So, for instance, you train the model English to Russian, and then you do some transfer learning to Ukrainian, and then you try to use that combination. Uh, or uh, you train these multi-language models, like the one shot from Google, where you train one model that wants to translate from every language to every other language. It's normally slightly weaker on the stronger language pairs, but it allows you to become stronger on the weak language pairs. And the idea is that there's this commonality between languages that you can capture in some way. It's still pretty researchy. The other side is you have languages that are strong, let's say English, Polish, English, Italian, but now you need to translate from Polish to Italian. And this happens to us quite a lot because if you think about uh, customer service, uh, people have these uh, excellent centers on different countries. So Poland is a, is a country that has a lot of excellent centers in Europe. Uh, and what our customers want is to serve different countries in Europe from Poland, like let's say Italy. And so what they want is the ability for their agents to write in, Pol- in Poland, uh, in Polish, and basically we do the for Italian and deliver that to the customer. And there you can do these multilingual models, but again, it's very researchy, so it's hard to make them work. Or what we're doing is basically triangulation. So we go from Polish to English, English to Italian, and then you're playing this broken phone game, so garbage in, garbage out, so it becomes slightly harder to do just with machine translation, but because we have the human at the end, they're very good at understanding the input, even if it's slightly corrupted because of the first machine translation step, understanding what wants to be be said and correct the output of the machine translation in a very efficient way. And this actually like allows us to scale the number of languages we can support in a very interesting way. That's fascinating, wow. That's so interesting. And I've never thought of it that way that there's certain languages that you need one way versus the other. 
Um, I, I actually want to dig a little deeper into the uh, to the business use cases. Mm-hmm. How are how are your customers using um, using your product? What's kind of like the before and after? Like that that was a really good one there um, with Poland, for example. But what are what are some other examples? I mean, so right now we are completely focused on customer service. So we're serving mostly like real time chat or emails, uh, and it's all about allowing companies to scale better. So you can now basically scale your customer service agent based on skills and not on language, which used to be a big problem, or to gain efficiency. So you can now move your support centers from any country to the Philippines, to Poland. Or if you're having a a peak season uh, in France, you don't have to hire more French people. And realistically, before in Babel, the solution for these use cases were to hire native speakers because you couldn't trust the machine translation because of the quality. And the the regular translation industry basically works in days and it's it's very expensive. And you have to find a solution that fit the the customer support SLA. So for instance, on an email, it's kind of a magic uh, experience. Let's say you're an agent working out of Zendesk and you say, okay, I speak English and you get an email in Chinese, it gets machine translation to English. So you understand what the customer is asking. You reply in English, you press send, and 10 minutes later, uh, your customer receives a message in Chinese with, with, good, with a guarantee of good quality. So we've basically been allowing these companies to test new markets much faster or to scale their support much faster, which is not really doable before. Yeah, the, the, clear, uh, the clear use case of, of being customer success, customer support, customer excellence, like, like you all talk about, uh, seems like it's, you know, the lowest hanging fruit where, where the rubber meets the road. How long did it take you to get to that point? Was that something that you knew from the very beginning or was that something that you, that you had to, to work your way towards? Uh, a mixture. So I remember the first time we presented on Babel to investors, we had a, a slide with the Zendesk use case. Uh, but then after YC, when we actually start selling, we're basically selling translation. So if you came to us and asked for a website, we'll do the website. We'll do a Zendesk customer. We had a MailChimp integration, a GitHub integration. And what we realized is that translation is actually very different products. So translating a website requires a completely different product, both from the input as to the translation, then an email, then a newsletter. And so we always had issues with uh, quality, context. So we spend some time understanding what is the best fit for this technology that we have. Uh, and then customer service was like the ideal place because it solved the real need. Uh, and we could do like the quality translations at the scale and speed that no one else on the industry could. So we're not now fighting with these big language service providers uh, that have all the relationships established for a longer period on the marketing content. But uh, it took us, I guess, around two years. I think it was after Series A that we, we nailed it. I mean, yeah, that's 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 the name of the game, right? That Series A is is to figure that piece out. What was it like going through YC? Uh, I mean, it was really, really good. I mean, it's uh, you get a lot of advices, pressure uh, to develop stuff, and the idea of going to like we're, we're all from Portugal, and the idea of going to San Francisco and be the five of us, which were the five founders, closed in one house. Uh, I remember I used to I, I had a three month old daughter back then, and just focus on the problem that you're trying to solve and on the product, it's an amazing experience. So I, I don't think Ambel will have reached where we are now if we haven't come through YC. When you have some, you know, lead tier investors, um, obviously, you know, Google Ventures being one of them and, and others, uh, it seems like you have a lot of people kind of in your corner. This is, you know, a huge need in the marketplace. The, the market for this is very big. Um, you know, I... It's one of those products that, um, you know, as we were prepping for this interview is, is really exciting because you just look 50 years into the future and you're like, there is no way that this problem isn't solved. It's a matter of like, who is going to solve it, right? Um, what kind of like responsibility do you feel like you have to, to kind of be the shepherd of, of solving this problem? <laughs> Pardon the pun here on shepherd. <laughs> we were just talking about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's interesting. I never felt it has a responsibility, but rather has a challenge. Um, I mean, so we definitely want to be the first ones to solve this problem. Uh, and we want to be the first ones to build the vision of having a translation layer that allows everyone to communicate over any means in a seamless way. 
Um, we just have to keep ourselves ahead of the curve and, and be careful with what other people are doing. It's very easy to get distracted and, you know, there's a lot of people working on this problem. But I, I, I don't know, it's for me, for me, this has always been like, I'm trying to solve the problems I was trying to do during my PhD in the real world. So it's very exciting. It's like a, I wake up every day really excited. It's not so much as pressure, but just like a excitement. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, you did. I mean, because the, the, the thing I was thinking is like, you know, with a company like yours, it's there's not really, uh, I guess it's not even solving it, right? It's more like getting it tuned in, right? Because there's no end point for, you know, customer support, right? Like there's no end point for, uh, for, you know, translation because the language changes and things change and new words and new phrases and new things are constantly coming about. And the way that you're going to continue to serve your customers over time will like continually change. So it's not, not necessarily that it, it's, you know, Mm -hmm. solvable in that way, but it just seems like that where we are today versus where we are, you know, in the not too distant future will be a, a very different place. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, and there's still a lot to be done in this area. Like, even like if you want to automate more of the translation, this full like customer service experience, there's a lot that we can do. Like uh, when you translate just with machine translation, it's very hard to capture the sentiment. Or it's very hard if you're basically being a translation layer in a chat conversation to, pe- to capture the actual intent and transfer from the source language to the target language. And that are some of the research problems that we're working on internally. Like, how can we convey that information to the other side? Because, you know, if you're a customer and you're complaining and you're really upset, and then I translate it to Portuguese and it sounds like you're super happy and the person responds accordingly, you might not be very satisfied with the experience. So there is definitely a lot to do there. And then the other part is how do you move from here? And we basically kind of become this layer. So if you have a company, you basically can say, okay, I'm just going to plug in a Bevel, and now we hook into all your systems from the customer service to the marketing department, to the sales department, uh, to the HR department, and then something, everything becomes multilingual in a very simple way. That is really where we want to get to. You mentioned something that, um, that I think is, uh, is a key component of this is, I mean, shoot, we get this wrong on Twitter every day. You can even be sarcastic on <laughs> Twitter or, you know, posting on, uh, in an email or anything like that without people being confused. I mean, half of you, and now we have the, um, you know, Google, or maybe it's Grammarly, or I don't even know some plugin that I have on my computer, uh, gives you the little frowny face, happy mm-hmm. face of like what the tone of your email is. Um, you know, like we're, we're bad enough with our own languages at, at deciphering intent. Um, and one of the things that has really helped that is emojis because it's like, you know, everybody in the world knows what a smile looks like or, or knows what, you know, a, a frown looks like for the most part, yeah. pretty baked into our DNA. So what, how does like emojis and, uh, and emoticons and things like that play into, you know, th- those type of experiences? I mean, so... Basically, those ones you can just pass from one side to the other one because, again, they're kind of universal. It's more like the subtleties if you're being sarcastic or you're just writing in words that you have to transfer to the other side. And, again, humans are good at detecting it. Although we're not perfect, we're definitely much better than the the computer unless you train the computer to do that. So the way I look at it is like you need to train your models and basically the instead of just saying translate sentence X to sentence Y, it's like, Translate sentence X, who has the emotion uh, X prime to a new sentence that conveys the same emotion. And that is a very hard problem because we don't even have data for that. So you first need to create data. And this again is where like having the human in the loop allows us to like start asking them to also annotate this extra data to then start measuring how good we do it and then improve it. So it's again this uh, human in the loop cycle data generation that I believe is going to put us in a good position to solve uh that issue as well yeah i you know you see a lot more of especially in customer support you know how is your experience mm-hmm. you know smiley face frowny face you know whatever things like that scale of one to ten you know those type of things um you know which is which is good for measuring you know satisfaction of the experience but as you mentioned it doesn't 
it doesn't get you closer to the actual thing that you're working on in real time, mm-hmm. right? It's like, so, you know, you can't say, you know, a third of the way through a conversation and like give someone smiley face or frowny face, like that doesn't solve their problem, especially if it's complex or if it's like a banking issue or things like that. And a lot of times, um, you know, people want to talk to a human being, right? Well, you can't do that at 2 a.m. or or whatever. In most cases, you can't, Um, you know, how does chat play into this in real time like that, that chat functionality? I mean, so what people are using is basically trying to use chatbots to do most of the cases. And then once you actually realize, okay, this is not getting where we want to get. Um, and again, this is what we call like the intent classification. So you basically know you want to solve the, the issue. You know how many iterations you should have and you try to guide the conversation. And if the system is failing, then that's where you get the human because naturally we tend to be better at solving uh, these complex issues. Now, obviously, if you don't have anyone available at that time of night, then you have, you have a problem. But this is also where if you remove the language as an issue, then you're bound to be able to have people 24-7 more easily because you can just go around the globe, use all your locations, uh, and basically you don't have to worry about what's the native language that they speak. You wrote a great piece in Forbes um, about what does it mean to be an AI company? And, and I really think that it was one of the best descriptions of what it means to be an AI company that I've seen talking about, you know, AI must be fundamental to your product. And so like Netflix using AI or Facebook using AI or Airbnb using AI, that doesn't mean it's an AI company because you could literally, li- they could live without it. They lived without it, you know, from, from the very beginning. But if you're an AI company, it's, if the AI is gone, you are gone. Uh, I love that description. Um, can you share just like what it means to be an AI company? Yeah, so that's that's basically what I feel like. For instance, if you if you think about the Babel, what we try to do is to create with this pipeline that can provide quality at scale. And to do that, you need to have machine translation. If you just had like take a document, give it to a person to translate and get it back, which is what normal language service providers do, it's not going to be fast. It's not going to be cheap. So it's impossible. So there there wouldn't be a Babel if there wasn't AI in the form of machine translation, quality estimation, just it wouldn't exist. So it's not, a, it's not an optimization feature. It's a feature that the product could not live without. The same way, like if you think of um, a self-driving company, a uh, car company, they can't live without AI because otherwise there's no self-driving cars without AI. So, you know, it puts a pressure on you because it's, you have to make it work. Now, there's different ways to make it work. And that's the second part of like the maturity level. So, I mean, you can start by using third-party AI tools and build your product around them. And this is pretty much what everyone does, what we did, especially to get the MVP. So you use Google Translate to get some humans, show them, they correct, they're like, okay, the idea is sound. And then you start working with that up to a point that, you know, that's not differenti- that much of a differentiation. So you have to develop your own AI. And it can be on the form of just taking like a machine translation engine and train with your own data and customize it to the pipeline. And then you, what I call the phase two, where you actually develop your own AI. And then you get to a point that if you want to give the other step change, you basically understand more problems. Like I understand that if I want to be really good at machine translation on chat, I need to develop a machine translation model specific for chat because chat is very small sentences in different languages where you definitely need the context to understand what is being said. So if I just translate a sentence in the, separately, the chances of getting it wrong are super high. So you need to research on how can I do translation looking at the context, knowing that the context is in different language? And then you hit the phase three where you're actually doing research to develop your own AI. And obviously different parts of the company might, might be in different maturity levels, but this is kind of how I see an AI company evolving over time. You all do a fun thing at your company that I think is pretty cool called Night Lab. Can you share what Night Lab is and how it came about? One of the things that we always love at Embevel, uh, because we were like, we're geeks from nature. It's like allow people to bring their ideas uh, and bring their disruptive things. And the challenge is when you're, when you're growing and you're kind of trying to find product market fit or you found it, you're so busy in the trenches that it's very hard to create space to do different things. Uh, I mean, Google did the 20% card. There's different approaches. And so at Unbevel, we always thought about how can we solve this? At the same time, don't lose focus. Uh, which is hard. And so we came out with um, two, two different things. 
Uh, one is the labs, which is kind of like a small group of people from Unbevel that we kind of remove them from the main pro product market fit run and, uh, and are more isolated to think about new disruptive products. So high risk, high, high success. And this, this is where our shared solution came from. The other one was more the night labs, which is everyone from Unbevel um, can work on any idea that they have related to Unbevel. Uh, it started by being, if you would stay at Unbevel Wednesday night, we'll pay you pizza and you could say they're working. Uh, now it's like you can do it whenever you want. And then you present it on uh, the all hands. We have an all hands every week. And then at the end of the quarter, the company votes for the best night lab presentation or project. And the people who did it, which cannot be the founders or the executive team, would win the price, a money price that they can spend on anything. Uh, and there's been like a, an amazing amount of interesting ideas coming out from the night labs. Things we never thought about, things that are immediately useful for the company, things that are super interesting, but you don't have time to pick it up. Uh, but it's definitely something that I, I truly love to see the, what people can come up with. It's so cool because it, it kind of harkens back to those, uh, those you know, days of staying in Silicon Valley and staying up late and working. And it kind of has that company DNA. But, you know, I mean, your company is, is you know, pretty big at this point. I, I'd imagine, you know, all sorts of innovation coming from, from the different corners. And if you don't have an outlet for that, then you're right. I mean, people just feel a little bit like, hey, all we, all we do is focus on one thing and it doesn't kind of get those creative juices going. Yeah, that's, that's definitely like a, one of the questions that we keep asking ourselves. How can we foster innovation within the company? Uh, how can we test more experiments? The other thing, we, we work a lot with, with academia, like uh, supporting like master theses, PhD theses, where we basically have some ideas and we allow people to work with and Babel and kind of like plant the seeds. And then if it grows, we basically can pick it up and develop internally. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So I think it's a struggle for growing companies. How can you keep innovating and trying new ideas while at the same time you have to deliver on your goals, which are always very ambitious. So it's, we're always trying new, new ways of doing that. Okay. Any, uh, any thoughts on, on what's next for Unbabel? What's next for, uh, for AI and machine learning? Um, peek into the future a little bit? Yeah, I mean, for Unbevel, the first part is we want to keep this uh, trajectory of like allowing companies to massively scale their multilingual support. That is kind of like part of our immediate journey. Um, and the second one is basically building this translation layer. Uh, for machine learning or NLP, I'm, I'm very curious to see how far we can get with this new basically embedding model. So there's solving an important problem, which is like, what do words mean into context? And we, they're very good at memorizing all this information, but they still like the reasoning part. So how can you reason and build abstractions on top of each other? Uh, and, and so I'm kind of curious to see what are the, the next years going to bring us on that front? What problems are we going to be able to solve that we can't solve right now? Because so far, I think that we haven't really been able to solve any problem that we couldn't do before, which is slightly better. Uh, so I'm very curious to see what's coming up over the next years. Okay. Let's get into our lightning round. These questions are fast and easy. Just like the Salesforce customer 360 platform, number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. You can go to salesforce.com slash platform to learn more. They're the best. They're our presenting sponsor and they're always here with us in our minds and in our hearts. Go to salesforce.com slash platform, learn more lightning round questions. Joel. Are you ready? Yes. Number one, what app on your phone is the most fun? Uh, unfortunately, I would say now it's Slack because I have a lot of fun seeing what everyone is doing and have the, the new things, but it's still work related. What is your favorite book or podcast or, uh, or movie or TV show that you've been binging recently? Uh, actually, I just finished watching the... Um, Fear City on Netflix from the, the mafia in uh, New York. Uh, it was uh, really interesting. I really loved it. What about a unknown, what's your, your secret superpower or your secret, uh, secret obsession? I love learning. I'm always trying to learn something new on any area. Like if you can teach me something, I'll just spend hours listening to you. I just love it. If you weren't a CTO, what do you think you'd be doing? Huh. I mean, like I told you, I love learning. So there's a lot of stuff I'd like to be doing. Uh, I mean, 
probably I'll just be like doing research. I, I really love like uh, having a hard problem to solve and basically like go all in to try to solve it. And we do have a, a lot of them. Uh, you know, this isn't a lightning round question, but I, I should ask this earlier. So do you lead that mini, uh, that mini team that does like those research projects? Yeah. Oh, cool. So that's like you're like a special special ops team that like falls under you that just works on those projects and then you kind of manage that in addition to the other things? Yeah. So we have the research one and we have the product one. And so we basically own them together. It's our experimentation part. Oh, cool. And then so how do you, how, what, when are there, do they have like deliverables or things that they have like timelines on or is it like kind of free experimentation and, and development? I mean, so this is something we haven't found the, the silver bullet. We've been experimenting. So they do have like, they have OKRs as everyone else. Um, so they have deliverables. I think the biggest challenge that we, I think we found a way to solve it is how, if something works, how do we pass it to the mainstream of the company? Like for instance, the beginning of Shed was very hard because you're basically asking people to be in discovery mode. And then it works. We have some customers using it and then you throw it to the production line. It's like, well, but this is full of bugs, not scalable, which is exactly what you want because you want people to move fast. But then you have all the rest of the company be like, what the hell is this? Uh, and also you lose a lot of context if you just throw this from one side to the other one. So what we did recently is slightly different. It's like you have people that are on this lab team and they keep trying stuff. And then if something works and you want to push it to production, Normally, some of the people who are involved in the beginning want to follow up with the idea because it's their baby. And so what you do is like you build a product team around. So product manager, product designer, engineers, AI people, we including the people that were on the original idea. And given that all the companies built around these uh, empowered product teams, you now just have a new one with more resources that start moving from this initial discovery phase more to delivery phase. And that means that these people actually leave this lab's apartment, but then other people from the company can join this either to work on an idea that they want to propose or an idea that they like. So we're trying to make this more of a cycle thing as opposed to like a, a siloed team in one corner because otherwise it's transitioning from the idea to a product becomes harder. Yeah, that's, that's really cool stuff. And it is, you know, it is the, the, uh, the crux of like the innovation problem is like how do you keep enough pressure that people, you know, are working towards something um, that it's not just kind of like loosey goosey, free form, um, you know, nothing on deadline has, you know, put some constraints on it, but also, you know, give some room for experimentation and, and, you know, creation. Okay. Back to the lightning <laughs> round questions. Um, what's your best advice for a first time CTO? Well, huh, interesting question. So I'll tell you what I would love to have done. So there's some books that I'd love to have learned about earlier. So for instance, learn more about product management just to have the same terminology than when you're talking with product people. So strongly recommend uh, reading the Inspire book by Martin Kagan. And know if you're a first time CTO on an early startup, it's, you, have to, you have to be careful with the stage because you, you go from being the person who codes everything to then being an engineering manager to then being more of a leader and letting go of everything that you've done. It's, it's not easy, especially when you hit that point of like, well, I could have done this faster, but you can't do it. You have to step back and potentially just create better documentation and explain to people where you're going. Because it's very easy for them, if you don't do that, for people to don't know what was the direction, why thing, what was a hack, and what was done intentionally. So definitely like this mentoring part is super important as you scale. Joel, this has been absolutely awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Any final thoughts? Anything to plug? Obviously, everybody check out Unbabble. It's such a cool company. I'm glad we uh, glad we got to chat chat with you. It's just unbabble.com. No, it was an amazing conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Awesome. Take care. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by the Salesforce Customer 360 platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experience, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com platform. <laughs>